I am Noel Welsh. I'm from a consultancy called Underscore. Um, quick question, who has got an Underscore book? Oh yeah, high five, come on. Yeah, and you, and you, and you, and you, and anyone else, any more fives need to be given up here? Yeah, okay. So, the books are free as of a few days ago. If you would like a book on anything from radial basics of Scala to all the type classes and monads and shape lists and that kind of thing, head over to underscore.io slash books, grab yourself a book. They're all there available for download or great, you can go to the source, go to GitHub. This talk, however, is not about books. This is about visualization. So pretty pictures, this kind of thing. Did that change? No, it didn't. You rotten thing. There we go. Okay, so another show of hands. Who does like data visualization or that type of thing in their day job? Okay. Half of you, cool. So some of you maybe have interest, some of you have practice. So it'll be interesting to know what you think of, uh, of Doodle. A little bit louder. Okay, I, I, I can shout a bit more. So Doodle is a visualization library. You can go to GitHub, you can grab it. Um, it'll be great. And in this talk, I want to tell you a bit about that Doodle, how it's architected for the design, uh, some general lessons that you might take from Doodle, because to be honest, not everybody's going to be writing a visualization library, but I think there are lessons I've learned about library design that generalize to maybe problems you'll work on. Um, I want to give you also an idea of what you can do with Doodle and what it's going to do in the future, because we have, I have big ambitions for it. Of course, delivering those ambitions is always the, uh, the challenge. So, right, let's start with a bit of visualization. Um, here are some numbers. Would anyone like to take a guess what these numbers represent? So just take a guess. I'm not expecting anyone to get it right. It's the whole point is to show how hard it is, so that maybe someone could indulge me by guessing the kind of shape they might form. X's, so X. Anyone else? Have you said at the front? X and Y's? Vectors. <laughs> okay. A sine wave? No, that's a good guess. A circle at the back? All right. Well, circle got it. Give me a hand. <laughs> First person to get that one right. Did you actually work it out as a guess? You have this fine cosine table built into your head. <laughs> That's amazing if you did. I mean, right? Yeah, good point. Yeah, good point. Okay. So it's a circle. So the point is that when you look at the numbers, it's hard to see the structure. But when you look at the the picture, it's very obvious what the structure is. And so visualization is a good thing. And we've got at least a third of our brain is devoted to vision. So we've got huge amounts of neural hardware given over to finding structure in visual data, so we may as well use that hardware. Unfortunately, there are not many good options for visualization in Scala. The people I talk to who do visualization, they tend to use JavaScript or Python libraries. Uh, let's have a show of hands. Who uses like visualization, does JavaScript visualization? Okay, most people, I guess D3 or things like that. What about Python or R? Okay. Right, and Scala, who does a visualization in Scala? A couple of people. It'd be interesting to know what you use, because I'm not aware of any good stuff in Scala. Unless you use Doodle, which would be amazing. Um, and I'm very surprised. So Doodle works with 2D vector graphics, and you can output in a bunch of different formats. You can just render direct from the Scala console, the REPL, using the Java 2D framework. So there's no need to go to a web browser or anything like that. You can render it in a web browser if you want, using Scala.js, rendering through SVG at the moment. You can output um, hard copies in PDF, SVG, CNG, and GIF, or GIF, depending how you prefer to pronounce it. So the majority of the pictures in this presentation were created with Doodle. And I will point out most of them, I guess I'll point them out when they're not. Um, and it is under active development. On Wednesday, we had the Scala open source spree and version 0.8.2 came out, and also there's version 0.8, and then version 0.8.1 when I messed up the, the bill. But we don't talk about that one. No one talks about 8.1. Okay. <coughs> so, what is the architecture of 
include all. Let's have a talk about that. So that will give us a context for the rest of the talk. I'm going to go through the architecture and talk about the lessons from this. So Doodle is built like a delicious layer cake. Three different layers. Starting at the top, from the highest level of abstraction, the chart language, it has the image language in the middle, and then the canvas, which is our lowest level um, way of rendering. So decreasing in abstraction as you go downwards, down this delicious cake, but increasing in expressivity. So you can do more things, but it's probably going to be a bit harder to do it as you move down that layer. A bit more time to the goal, depending on your goal, of course. And the other thing is that the, the decreases reasonability. So this, I think, is a, a bit of a fundamental trade-off you can make. As you increase expressivity, you allow more things, more, 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 possi more possibilities, but it becomes harder to actually reason about the code itself. What, is it, what exactly is it doing? I think this is one of the first lessons in library design, this, this trade-off that we'll see. So let me illustrate this by showing you some of the languages. Let's start with the chart languages. So this is the, uh, the least expressive, the highest level of abstraction, and this is for doing what I think most people want to do when they visualize stuff, which is to do things like scatter plots and bar charts and so on. So in Doodle, if you wanted to um, plot some data, you would do something like this, chart, scatter plot, a series and draw it, and you get a result just like we saw earlier. So this is Doodle output here. Um, a quick note that this is work in progress. I did have a design for this. I implemented a bunch of it. I decided it wasn't working. Uh, and the next version is uh, still in development. So there are various things you can do here. And if you've used other charting software, you'll know about these kind of things. You can change the color and the shape of the marks that indicate where the data is. You can change the little ticks on the axes, make them bigger or smaller, and change where they are and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> so you have a reasonable amount of flexibility there, but you're still fundamentally limited. And the model I've chosen, if you're limited to 2D graphs, and you have a single y-axis at the moment. So none of these fancy graphs that have two y-axis is different. Okay, you might add that later, but it's just an example of how you kind of you limit the domain, you make it easy to achieve a particular goal, but you limit you know, what you can actually do. You can't do some crazy pictures like we'll see later. OK, so there are a few predefined um, chart types that you have to basically work with in this model. Now, the, the underlying lesson here <coughs> are the assumption that most people are beginners. I think that's a reasonable assumption. Most people, when they come to your, you know, more people will come to your library than will stay with it. And um, the other thing, which I think is very important, is that you've got to assume that most people are actually interested in solving their problem than they are in messing around with your library. So I think it's really important to make the common cases easy. And that's the strategy I've taken here. So you have these chart interface. You just plot something up. It's very easy to work with. Limits what you can do, though, but it's probably what most people are trying to do, is to get a scatter plot or a histogram or something like that up on the screen, bar chart. And I want to give you an example of how this works in another library, a library that I really like, which is Circe. So who's used Circe here? Yeah, it's great. So Circe is a really good library for JSON stuff. If you use JSON stuff, you should take a look at Circe. It's really good. Circe, like most JSON libraries, is type class based. And one of the, the um, annoyances with type class based libraries is that you have to define a lot of these instances to encode and decode things. But with Circe, what you do is you just go import Circe generic auto underscore, and it just works, right? Just in the same way when you just call in doodle chart dot scatter plot, whatever, draw, you just get a basic scatter plot with some sensible defaults. Same thing happens in Circe. It serializes your data or reads your data with some sensible defaults. And that's what most people want to do, the common cases. Optimize those common cases, make them easy. Um, now, I think the obvious question to ask here is, OK, what about things that are uncommon? What about when you go off the path? What about the more complicated things? And in Doodle, that's when we move down to the next delicious layer in our cake, which is the image library. So 
series. So the image library allows us to express more complicated things, richer pictures than we've seen before, and requires us to do a bit more work to do that. So I'm going to talk about the fundamental abstractions that make up the image library, give you a feel for what it can do, and then the lessons that I've um, derived from this. So <coughs> images, being, uh, being a vector graphics library, is based on paths and the relationships between paths. So let me explain what, they, what, what that means in a bit more detail. So a path is a sequence of moves, lines, and curves that specify some kind of shape. Paths can be, let me skip the slide. <coughs> paths can be open or closed. So here are some examples. I've got my laser pointer, which I'm very excited to use. So this here is a curve, and that's an open path. And a closed path means a path that connects back to itself. And you can see the difference in this triangle. This is an open triangle, even though it actually ends where it begins, because it's not a closed path. It doesn't have this additional little bit added to it to close the shape of. So that's an example there. We have lines. We have curves. Um, we have some other fun, fun effects. Open, that's what open and closed paths basically are. So there's a standard way of expressing shapes in vector graphics libraries. If you look at, say, PDF or the Canvas library on, in HTML, other things, they all have these basic primitives. Right. So what about layer, though? This is where we get a little bit different from these typical vector graphic libraries. We have layout operators like above, beside, and on. So to give you an example, you can have a circle beside a circle, and you get what you would expect. You have a circle beside a circle, and you can hopefully read that code and see that, yes, that is indeed what it says. So it's uh, giving you some nice tools beyond the absolute coordinate system that you might be used to if you've done lower level graphics programming that make it easier to reason about what you're getting here. Um, all right. So how exactly does layout work? Well, layout works by building bounding boxes around the images. An image, an image can be a compound image, or it could be a, a primitive, like a circle we've seen. And then each bounding box has an origin, and we align the origins in the way, depending on how we are doing the layout. So I'll show you an example. Here we have the, uh, a triangle next to a circle, triangle beside a circle. And the red outline is the bounding box, and the red circle is the origin. And you can see the side is aligning those origins horizontally. But not, you can see here, this is because the origin starts here, the circle is not uh, vertically aligned with the, with the triangle. The triangle is up a little bit higher because of where the origin is located. So that's basically how the um, layer operations m work. And when you do this, you create a compound image which will have itself have a bounding box, and it will have a new origin. And that origin is located along the line connecting these origins, and it is midway um, along the width of the entire compound object. So it will be somewhere over here, I guess. I do that midway. All right. So this is quite nice for very structured images, and you can do some fun things with it. Um, so for example, like charts, you have a, typically you have a a data area, you have a, maybe a key that might be next to it, you have a title above it, or perhaps below it. So you can see this kind of layout works well for those quite structured images. But not everything can be expressed with this. So we have another way of doing layout, which is basically uh, displacement via a vector. So when you say something like this, circle out and offset, you are basically, whoop, back we go. <coughs> You're basically uh, displacing the circle relative to its origin by the, the vector given there. So let's put that code back up. So I skipped the last few slides. That's a displacement by that vector. Um, and then the usual things, um, affine transforms, scale and rotation and flipping things and so on. But I won't go into those. What I do want to talk about quickly is some of the things that, that will be coming soon, which I learned I needed when I was building the graph library the first time around. Um, it's nice to be able to move the origin in a compound shape. So what I mean by that, 
Well, when we have this, as I said earlier, the origin is in the center of the, the uh, center of the width of the bounding box and on the line connecting the origins. Um, so it'd be there. But sometimes what you really want to be able to do is to move that origin. For example, you might want to move it to the place where the things join. This comes up in graphing, for example, when you're adding ticks and you want to make sure the ticks sometimes extend below and above the axes that they're indicating and you want to make sure that everything's aligned properly and maybe the, the uh, label underneath the tick as well gets aligned. It's much, it's much more convenient to work with this type of system. So I, I need to have more expressivity there about specifying exactly where the origin is in the new compound shape. Maybe it doesn't move, maybe it does move, maybe it moves to the join, so on. Other things, um, padding or shrinking bounding boxes, another operation I have found myself missing and I need. And ultimately, I like a little bit more flexible than up these um, above the side on layout. I'd really like to be able to say, put a vector joining origins along some particular path and then basically uh, put the uh, images at any location along that vector. And that'd be a little more flexible and I could express above and beside and on in terms of this operator whilst also allowing more possibilities than they have. Okay. So lots of images have this kind of simple structure that we can capture. So the fractals, we, we um, have this structure. We use Doodle in Creative Scarlet. Some of you might have seen the Ignite talk I gave yesterday. And um, you can use this to express lots of fun things. That, you can use it for these kind of very structured images like you have in the charting example. Um, and it's nice to provide this system because it, it allows, it's easy to reason about when you read something beside something, you know what's going to happen. Something on something is much easier to work out what's going on than to try to work it out from absolute coordinates. And it's compositional. You can create little components of images and you can glue them together using these operations. So it's quite a, quite a nice way to work with for certain um, elements. The other part is that you don't have to really make a decision between chart and image. This is opt-in complexity. So in the chart prototype that I'm working on, you can specify parts of your chart that are just this chart is generated from an image. So you can drop down to the image language for the little part that you want, a bit more expressivity, or you can keep the... Um, the high-level chart language where you, where you want it. So you can mix and match the two. And that, again, is something I see in Cersei. And the way this works is Cersei has encoder and decoder type classes for doing encoding JSON and decoding JSON. And um, you can just implement them where you want them to override the defaults that you get from the auto-encoding. So it's not an either-or decision. You don't have to choose to do auto or your own. You can combine the two. You get the auto where it works and have your own special cases where that auto doesn't work, like you have a special capitalization convention. So opting in to complexity, not having to have an either-or um, decision is something, I think, an example of good library design. OK. So the final layer in the cake is the canvas. And Canvas is about images like this. This uh, is not generated by Doodle, um, though it could be generated by Doodle. I don't have the compositing operations I need. So that's just, just kind of technical details, which I'm happy to talk about because I spent a good bit of time recently figuring out what I was missing. But anyway, this type of image, um, I really like it. I think it's like a really nice image. It's a bunch of Bezier curves, basically, that I've got some random noise. Um, the thing that's notable about it is it's got millions and millions and millions of points in it. And the um, problem can be the image is generating intermediate data structure. So to do that layout, we need to know how big everything is and to have work out how big everything is, we need to know what color and line width and all this kind of stuff. Um, so you can't actually draw anything until you've got the complete image available. And the problem with intermediate data structures is they, they can be uh, the, the performance of, of walking over the data structure can be quite large, or just the memory usage itself. So um, when I've been working on little prototypes of generating this thing, and it's quite easy to run out of memory when you get a few million points. 
KVM is not particularly frugal with memory. You, you may know. So <coughs> what is nice is things like this that don't really have a great deal of structure is if we could draw directly onto the screen or the, the canvas, as I call it. So it could be a file, it could be the screen. So we have facilities to do that. And a canvas is basically this sort of thing. Um, so it's a, an imperative API. Um, it is a church encoding for anyone who's in my other talk. Uh, a church encoding of the final form that an image gets transformed into. Um, it has a very close correspondence to the back-end rendering API. So if you look at the Java 2D API, you look at the HTML canvas or the SDG specification, they're fairly close to that sort of API. So it's quite easy to implement the different back-ends, um, which is nice. And of course, if anyone was in the talk about church encoding, this is the type of uh, extensibility we, we want in the OO style, so it's appropriate here. All right, talk a bit about future plans. Um, so where are we going? So extending image layer operations are high priority. As I discussed, there are some things I need there. We just finished up the charts. So I think that's been, I imagine, it'll be most useful to the most uh, people. I think visualizing data is more common than producing kind of generative art. And um, then there's a whole bunch of other things, adding gradients, compositing operations, also just more image stuff that can be done. But uh, to my mind, the, the more interesting stuff that comes a little bit later. Firstly, we have some rendering bugs in the PDF output I'm using, which is very annoying. And I think that might be a bit of a problem for some people. It's a problem for me because lots of the images in Creative Scala have errors in them. Um, so really, where, where the exciting stuff is, is um, using a recursion scheme encoding. Again, it's a little bit of jargon. The idea here, though, is that you want to be able to specify little different languages. So things like a PDF backend, it's going to only support 2D vector stuff, whereas running to a web backend might support interactivity, mouse clicks and resizing and so on. And what you don't want is just to limit it, limit Doodle, to the lowest common denominator. Ideally, you should be able to take advantage of whichever particular backend you're targeting, and not in a way the way you just throw exceptions. It should be statically um, assured that if you have a image that requires interactivity, for example, you can only render it on a platform that supports interactivity. So really you want to create little languages for these different concepts and then compose them together to form the language that you're working with, depending on the back end that you're targeting. So said we need animation, we need interactivity. I think that's quite useful for a lot of use cases. And that's something a little bit further down the line, but it's, um, I think, a, a very important thing to do. So let's get some conclusions. What have I learned? What have you hopefully learned? I don't know. Hopefully you agree that this layer design works nicely. And it certainly, I think, is a, a good design for Doodle. Um, we can, from each layer, you can also drop down to the layer below if you just need a little, to do a little bit there. I think optimizing for beginners, or basically making the most common cases easy, is uh, a good way to design libraries. But you still want to provide options for experts. And the layer design gives us the ability to do this. Um, making composition of layers easy is also a nice thing to be able to do so that you don't have to make these large raw decisions. The final thing that I haven't really um, mentioned much is go and read the literature. Um, Doodle is inspired by a lot of work on what's called graphical grammars. And there's a good chance that any problem you may be working on, somebody's already at least solved something close to it. And if you go and find other solutions, you can save yourself a lot of time. So that, I think, is very important. And again, if we look at, say, 30, for example, it builds on top of Argonauts. It's not trying to reinvent the wheel. And that means you can spend more time working on the, the, uh, the nice features rather than just building the foundation to the point where you have something interesting. All right. That's me. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> All right. Does anyone have any questions? Points. OK, so um, I've been asked to repeat the question. So the question was, can I talk more about the animation support? Well, um, I think animation has been something that's reasonably well explored in terms of the 
uh, functional reactive programming or reactive programming literature, this idea of having signals or behaviors or so on. So a mouth move is like a, a, a series, if, if you like, or a, a signal of x, y coordinates. And um, then you want to wire these things up, uh, your keyboard, your mouse, and um, have, have the um, display change in accordance to them. So rather than displaying one image, you would maybe you're displaying a sort of stream or a signal, or whatever you want to call it, a reactive stream of images. and that Images, those images are determined by some input, like the mouse and, and the keyboard input. So I think that model works quite well. I think the, um, the challenge is probably wrapping up some common things in a really easy to use way, because people don't want to have to sit there and program their own little tooltips and so on. They just want things to be really easy to use out of the box components. Um, again, there's some work on this. There's a nice paper, Vega, a gram of interactive graphics. Well, they, they've got some nice abstractions that I intend to steal when I get around to implementing it. And I think there's also work in the web development community, things like React and so on. They're probably not quite targeting the, the right level of abstraction, but I think I can get some ideas from them on how to proceed. So one of the interesting issues is, do you try to do full updates or do you do partial updates? And doing partial updates, like only changing the bit of the image that, that's being changed by the input. It's much faster, more complicated to implement. That'll probably be down the line. You know, get something working first and then optimize it. Is that a reasonable answer? Yeah. Great. The question was, uh, does the framework support, um, I guess, relative widths and heights? Like saying, this box is half the size of this other box. Uh, the question is, no, we do not support that at this point in time. Um, it's something I would like to do, something I've been thinking about. I think I know how to do it. Um, and uh, it's just getting around to doing it, really, I guess. <laughs> and then seeing if my ideas actually work in practice. OK, well, it's just about the end of the conference. Got the panel coming up. Get everyone tired. Let's go grab some coffee and wake up and feel good. Thank you very much, everyone.